There are a lot of different aspects to performing live. I've been fortunate to have started at a very young age. So some of the stuff doesn't affect me adversely as maybe it should. You know, it's kind of like when you see these college athletes playing in like national championship game and they're like two years old and they're like in front of 100,000 people and you go, how did that guy make that catch? Doesn't he know that like 100,000 people are watching and 8 million on the air? When you're that young, you don't really realize what's happening. So when I started doing Saturday Night Live as a teenager, I didn't really have time to think about uh, the fact that it was live television and millions of people were watching and it was the hottest show on television. I just didn't have time, we had to execute. I only started thinking about it when I was doing Letterman. We, the band was so popular that I started thinking about, oh my God, like, wow, this is kind of heavy. And that's because I got older and I was like, I realized what was happening, you know? I was like, this is kind of crazy. The first time James Brown appeared on The Letterman Show in 1982, it was incredible. And we blew his mind because he didn't think that our band was gonna be like that. But we had Will Lee, Hiram Bullock, Paul and myself. We had been waiting to play with James Brown our whole lives. We have been working up to this moment. So when we got the opportunity to do it, we were so freaking on it that we scared him to death and he couldn't believe it. And he was looking back, he was like, oh. And then he took over the show. You know, he just took over the show. All the guests got bumped, everything. We did three numbers and I had like family in the audience and my sister was in the audience, you know. It was really an amazing thing. And after the show, I went back to meet him. I wanted to get his autograph on a cue card because I had a cue card. Um, that said more with James Brown, so I wanted him to autograph it. He was sitting under a hair dryer, like he had the crown on his head. And it was really funny because Al Sharpton was standing right behind him. Al Sharpton used to do his hair. Anyway, so, and he gets up from the thing and he, he, he grabs me and he says, brother, you're high. And, I, and I'm saying to myself, I'm not high, really, I'm not. And he goes, you're high, your energy is high. He said, this is the best show I've done in front of cameras since the Tammy show. Now, I don't know if anybody realizes what that means. The Tammy show is one of the greatest shows ever in the history of mankind. So for him to say that was the greatest compliment that I, I think you could ever receive. If that's the greatest show that he thought he did in front of cameras since the Tammy show which I can say that I've seen a lot of great performances he's done between the Tammy show and our performance, but that's how inspired and pumped up he was about this television appearance. And if you check it out, it's really an amazing performance. And he's kind of stepped out of his thing and went other places that he hadn't gone in years. And it was basically the, I think, the finest musical moment in the history of Late Night. I realized I wanted to be a musician when I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan the first time. But I must say that I had been listening to music before I was born, because there was music always in the house. So I was listening to, as I always say, as like schizophrenic, I was listening to Miles Davis in one area and the Beatles in the, the other area. Uh, my parents being uh, inspirational people and listening to music all the time, so that meant that it was positive and they encouraged me even if I wasn't behaving correctly or whatever. My mother had a very close friend named L.V. Dorsett. And L.V. said to well, no matter what you do, don't take the music away from him. So when I got grounded, they let me practice. 
So I couldn't go out. They let me stay in my room and listen to music and practice. And I thought, well, this is amazing. This is cool. This is not like being punished at all. This is fantastic. It, it forced me to focus. So I listened to all my favorite music and I got into how it was made and, and became like a music rat, kind of like people are gym rats, you know. Well, the drum chair is the best seat in the house. You're the captain of the ship. You can actually dictate the tempo of the evening. You can do all kinds of stuff. I look at it in the audience. If the, if the audience isn't grooving, I know something's wrong. I will shift the tempo. You know, I can adjust, you know. The guitar player can miss a note. A singer can sing a bad note. Bass player can flub. Keyboard player, whatever. If you're a drummer and you drop a beat, or you did anything, the whole thing comes crashing down. And that is one thing that is not glossed over. Everyone in the house knows that the drummer missed the beat and has affected the whole, the heartbeat of the entire evening. So there's a lot more riding on the drummer's performance than any other, in my opinion, than any other um, member of the band. It's something that I love to do as part of my DNA. I, like I breathe, eat and sleep and drink music. I don't over obsess about it because I love it so much. It's a real blessing that I'm able to do this all the time and I can have a livelihood in music. I, I, I don't know, even if I weren't making a living at music, I would still be making music. Music is like the soundtrack of your life, really. You always, there's always a song that reminds you of something or a feeling that you've had the first time you did this, that song was on and everything, and it's in our culture. And it's one of our greatest exports, the music that comes out of America. America, even though it's a very young country, it has really changed the landscape of music. You know, the thing about music, it's a, it's a universal language. It gives me life. It, uh, music gives life, it sustains life. Music is life.